I've been absolutely geeking out this summer, doing research, learning an awful lot. Over the last 20 years, it has become a goal of metal detecting companies to make detectors that can just be plug and play. They haven't always been like that. In fact, in this video, I'm going to prove to you that we sometimes go a little bit crazy for metal detecting formulas, you know, configurations which optimize the detector for the ground and such. We get, we go overboard with that, overboard. You want to know the secret on how to win in metal detecting? You have to swing over it. That's right. You just have to swing over it. Get on good ground and do your thing. Can you calibrate a detector for the conditions? Sure. Yes, there's truth to that. But 95% of the capability in any given detector is in the programs because that was made by engineers, engineers who tested in multiple environments. And sure, you can tinker with that, but I think the most that you could hope to get is another 5%. I would argue that you should especially believe in the general factory-made programs if you believe in simultaneous multi-frequency metal detectors. Now let's make things really interesting. So keep this in the back of your mind during this video. Now, this is a lawsuit from 2016. We won't mention the companies here. We're going to read the background, though. Metal detecting, it turns out, is not as simple as one would think, unless the operator achieves some level of proficiency in setting the parameters on the metal detector. She might end up turning up targets that she has no interest in finding, what's called trash in metal detecting parlance, while leaving behind the stuff that she actually wants to find. Setting those parameters just right is apparently no easy task. The lawsuit itself is irrelevant, but the verbiage, what is being said, is completely relevant. Bring on simultaneous multifrequency. The lawsuit was not about simultaneous multifrequency, but you could see the direction that their minds are going with this. This is very telling, and SMF was a future solution. The nature of the predominant trash and the nature of the desired target changes from one place to another. A detectorist had to own several complete detectors to enjoy the advantage of having maximal sensitivity to disparate targets in different environments, one to find gold, for example, and one to find relics. The inventors proposed to address these two problems by creating a metal detector that could retrieve operating parameter data from an external source, either a computer or another metal detector, store the data in electronic memory within the metal detector, and modify the operating parameters of the metal detector to conform to the set of values of operating parameters specified by the operating parameter data. As they saw it, this would allow a less skilled operator to successfully use a single metal detector in multiple operating environments and with different types of targets and trash. I'm not interested in the lawsuit itself. I'm interested in the fact that metal detecting companies were aware that you had to dumb it down for the average user. So metal detecting companies knew that people would get frustrated if they kept digging trash. And look at this, this is the coin mode on the old Garrett AT Pro. And you see this diagram and metal detectors of the era, I'd say 2010 and before, you'd see uh, something like this for uh, target ID. And look at this, you have the pull tab in here, you have foil down here. And do you know how much gold you're giving up with that? Let me tell you how I really feel. All right, I'm coming out firing on this one. If you notch, you simply enjoy pushing buttons. You ever meet the guy or girl detectorist who notches out numbers on the detector because they know exactly what they're looking for. They know what they're going to find, what they want to find, and they just decide, oh, let's cut this number out because that's going to be trash. Well, watch this. 
Well, hello everybody. This is Merrill from Metal Detecting NYC, and I'm gonna teach you something about target ID. Now, I got the manticore here. It was submerged. The speakers are gonna be a little bit low. That's all right. Um, it was submerged in water this morning, so you might not hear it too well. Good job, Merrill. Way to clarify that it was submerged in water and not gravy. But uh, fortunately, we have Gabby here. She's gonna take pictures of the screen when we do this. So let's put this piece of aluminum foil down and let's go over it. And if you could look at the numbers here, can you point the camera at the numbers here? Perfect. So we're getting, the size of it is kind of overwhelming it. The numbers I see the most are the 20s. Okay, now what we're gonna do is we're gonna take this same piece of aluminum foil, and we're gonna fold it just like that. And now, you know, the density is, uh, it's gonna be different, but in terms of the weight, it, it's the same piece of aluminum foil. Now watch. Fifties we're getting from up here. And you get closer, it's just not sure what surface to get. But from up here, it's 50s. Let's do it again. So I'm gonna fold this again. And again, and let's take a look at this. Solid 50s. That didn't change much, I guess, but let's do this again. I'm gonna fold this and Let's see, can we fold this again? Sure, we can. Let's fold this all the way. Isn't this exciting, Gabby? She's like, no comment. Um, anywho, I'm gonna stamp on it. Same piece of aluminum foil. Now, watch this. Got it on the screen? Sixties, consistently sixties. Let's try to fold this one more time. I think we can one more time. Let me stamp on this. There we go. And you ready? Screen. Say what? 80s. How about that? You just saw a single target that was malleable, aluminum foil, and you saw a range of over 60 points on the target ID. Now, I know we just showed aluminum foil, but what about silver? Silver, it, it says right here, it's gonna be in the upper end of the range. We have a silver chain and we have a Morgan dollar. I've never found one of these. I bought this for this purpose right here. Uh, I did find this. Now, let's take a look at the weights of these, okay? And we all know silver is the highest conductor. We've got uh, 0.8 ounces. Uh, right here for this chain and we have the Morgan dollar right here 0.9 ounces they're very close now we all know that silver is a high conductor and high conductors usually fall on the high end of a target ID scale but check this out let's do the Morgan dollar first as high as 97 Okay, now let's bowl this up. Okay, I'm gonna bowl this up. I'm gonna put it in my hand like this. And what's happening is the silver is not as dense. There is a higher density of silver in this than this. This is more spread out. These are links and I've noticed when that happens, when you have smaller things more spread out, like links in a chain, you're going to get a lower target ID when compared to when it is melted together in one big piece. And the next point I'm going to drive into your mind is metal detectors have been dumbed down compared to a generation ago. For all the new detectorists out there, these things were put on the boxes, in this case with the AT Pro, 
so that people can feel successful. But now let's go back a generation of detectors to 1996 and let's take a look at setting up a metal detector in 1996. Granted, this was one that was notoriously tough, but also one that is still loved to this day, the Nautilus. Hi, I'm Tom Smith. Congratulations on your purchase of your new Nautilus DMC metal detector. Your selection of the Nautilus DMC will enable you to many hours of fun, adventure, and hopefully the discovery of many valuable finds and artifacts. Today I'd like to share with you some helpful tips in plain terms that will help you use your Nautilus DMC metal detector through a better understanding of how your detector works. I'm taking excerpts of this video. I'm going to link to the entire video in the video description. Today's metal detectors are more complex than ever. Through time, many features have been added. It was only 26 years ago when discrimination in metal detectors was first introduced by Jerry Tyndall, the maker of your new Nautilus metal detector. I'll respectfully disagree with that. According to patent records, Robert Gardner was the inventor of discrimination in metal detectors. They certainly have come a long way since then. Through development, many features have been added to make the DMC perform better. Ferrous and non-ferrous discrimination, coil balancing, and variable power output. By doing this, tuning your DMC can become quite intricate. That's the reason that we wanted to share with you some tips and recommendations to help you understand your machine better. During this video, I'll take you through each step of tuning and balancing your machine. I'd like to suggest that you have your machine in front of you as we discuss the various functions, setups, and features of your new machine. Your DMC uses four 9-volt alkaline batteries. We recommend using Mallory Duracells or rechargeable nickel cadmium batteries. You can expect around 15 hours of use from them if you use your machine continuously. It's a good idea to carry an extra set of batteries with you in the field and rotate them after about three or four hours. This lets your batteries refresh and gives you the benefit of having fresh batteries all day. Next, we're going to discuss a very important facet of your machine, your controls. A shown right here as your discrimination and ground reject discriminant switch. Well, this looks harder than today's detectors. B is your power on and off switch that we showed you earlier. C is your automatic tuning switch up front. D is the discrimination Venera dial. It varies the amount of rejection to unwanted targets such as nails and bottle caps. E is the, the sensitivity control. It controls the sensitivity for the discrimination. F is the tune control. It sets the threshold volume for the ground reject balance in regular modes. G is the ground balance Venera dial. It's used for varying the amount of ground rejection. H is your sensitivity control for the ground balance mode. It varies the amount of depth of the ground balance in regular discriminant modes. I is the stereo headphone jack. Plug your headphones in here. Here's an important one, J. This is your power switch right up front. Now, in fairness, everything that was said so far, these are controls that we're used to on modern detectors, but here's where it starts to get wild. K, these are your two controls called R and C down front on the bottom. That stands for resistance and capacitance. They are for setting the search loop balance. We'll talk about that next. L is the search loop balance on and off switch located in the middle of the machine. M is the battery charging jack. Don't call me jack. Just below the on and off. We'll discuss the applications of these controls later in this video. So I recently purchased a Nexus metal detector that's analog just like this one and I'm looking forward to it being a real learning experience, 
But remember, the whole point of me showing you this is the direction that metal detectors are going today is ease of use, plug and play. Generation ago, they were not plug and play. An induction balance metal detector is at its best when the transmitter and the receiver coils have perfect balance. The two main factors that affect the balance are temperature and power. Therefore, to assure a perfect balance in any circumstances, there are two controls marked R and C right here. They are used to adjust the search loop balance. We'll call it SLB for short. You know, people leave in the comments all the time the, the saying, you have to know your detector, make sure that you know your detector. You know what? It doesn't apply nearly as much anymore. We're in a plug and play generation of detectors and maybe you just like to push buttons. A variable power control switch here is for adjusting the transmit power. This enables you to choose the power for the ground type. The voltage can be adjusted anywhere from 6 to 44 volts, or high, medium, and low. The lower voltage is for highly mineralized ground, and the higher voltage is for good to moderately mineralized ground, or slightly trashy areas. Sounds like my backyard, for instance. The whole mine lab more power thing, this was more power before more power. I'd like to mention some of the earlier models, like this one, which has a three-way power switch instead of the newer variable control switch. The switch marked SLB, which is located in the top right here in between the two sensitivity controls. It must be turned on when any adjustment is made to the R and C controls. If this was a TikTok video, he would have been swiped up a hundred thousand times before he finished a sentence. The search loop balance adjustment must be made first before any other adjustment is made. By the way, when making these adjustments, the search loop must be held away from any metal object, of course. Of course. That makes sense. When you're making the RNC adjustments for the first time, use a low transmitter power setting of, uh, let's say, a number six. After becoming familiar with the adjustments, higher power can be used. Also, a note, it doesn't matter which control is set first, since both controls are adjusted in the same manner. This is a bleeping physics class. Now that you are familiar with the transmitting power adjustment, the search loop balance function, and the RNC controls, let's look at the procedures for setting up the search loop balance. These instructions are also in your owner's guide, by the way. Okay, here we go. Now pay attention. First, set your sensitivity control to, let's say, number three. Then let's get the transmit power control to six. Okay. Set your auto-tune switch to off. That's right here. All right. Set your R and C controls to the 12 o'clock position. Then tune your SLB switch to ON. Now push the red button, hold it in, and switch the unit ON. Adjust the tune control here until a low tone can be heard. Bro, every time the electric slide comes on, people try to pull me on the dance floor because they know I'm just going to like pummel somebody, not on purpose, accidentally. How many steps? Now, release the button. That wasn't so bad, was it? <laughs> Bro. <laughs> Next, I'll turn either the R or the C switch to the left or right, whichever I've chosen to work with, until the tone disappears. Now push the button again to bring the tone back. Turn the control to the same direction until the tone disappears. It, it, it was my understanding this was how you launched missiles during the Cold War. Yeah, you'd get a code that's like 150 characters long with letters and special characters. Yeah. Press the red button again to bring the tone back. Follow me so far? No. Do that procedure until the tone no longer disappears, but just starts to rise. When you turn the control left and right, you will hear a small null in the volume. After the null has been reached on that control, 
Simply repeat the process again for the other control. The next time somebody says you have to know your detector, you just tell them you're in a different age. This is plug and play. Once the dip or null has been reached on both controls, switch the SLB switch to the off position. This wraps up the SLB adjustment. Miracle. That will become second nature once you do it a few times. Sir, I need four years and multiple classes for your metal detector. Here's a little tip too. On a cold day, repeat the procedure every 15 minutes for the first hour or so when you first get out into the field. S say what? Repeat the process every 15 minutes? What? Remember the two things that affect the coil balance. Temperature and power. That's right. This gives the unit a chance to get used to the temperature and conditions. What? Now that we've set up the search loop balance, we're ready to set up the ground discriminant and ground balance mode. If you notice the sun in the background has shifted, he spent the majority of his morning setting up his metal detector. And you have to repeat this every 15 minutes. You would use this method for general hunting using both modes. By following them closely, you will achieve perfect ground balance in every location that you hunt. It's very important that your DMC is ground balanced correctly. You'll want to refer to the owner's manual on pages 3 through 7 to set it for the type of hunting that you are doing. Once you've done that, follow these procedures. Pause the tape at this point and then return it again once you've made these adjustments. Since the ground reject discrimination mode relies on the ground balance signal, special care in tuning the ground balance must be taken. Since there is no tuning to the ground reject discriminant mode, no tune will be heard until a target is passed. Here we go. First press the red button. Switch the unit on and turn the con tune control to a clockwise direction until a comfortable tone is heard in your earphones. Now release the button. Everyone still with me? Bro, we left at the minute mark. Now let's lower the coil towards the ground to check to see if it gets louder or lower. If it gets lower, increase the ground balance of the narrow dial to 61. Press the red button once and release it. Raise the head again and once again the head towards the ground. Okay, if it stays steady, and doesn't change, the unit is ground balanced properly. And if it still gets lower, increase the Venera dial to 62. Then raise, press the button, and lower again. This video makes me appreciate AI. Most detectors are able to track ground conditions or at least have a setting where you could turn it on and off or a really easy manual adjustment to the ground balance. I like that. That's progress. Remember, lower, increase, higher, decrease. It should be balanced now. After ground balancing, you might want to decrease the ground balance sensitivity from 10 to around 3. This stabilizes the unit, which I recommend doing. Also, if you happen to change locations, you'll want to rebalance the unit again. That was a lot to remember. I thought it wasn't so bad but it's really quite simple once you do it a few times. Bro, you're, you're like a girl I used to date. There are a few other ways to ground balance your machine, depending on how you prefer to hunt. Refer to your owner's manual for instructions on seashore hunting and for setting for regular discrimination in ground reject discrimination mode only. Hmm. The main thing is to set your search loop balance first, then set your ground balance. Once these setups have been completed, you're ready to start hunting. I like to sweep mine back and forth about two or three feet swing. Staying close to the ground as possible and maybe uh, possibly trying to not touch the ground. I'm sure it will become second nature after a few times out in the field. Remember, always cover your holes. Bro, I I'm Barry. Always get permission from the landowners and never hunt on state or federal property that's posted. So there's two major points that I want you to take away from this. One, detectors have been made intentionally a lot easier. Don't fight that. Like, 
yes, you have to know the controls of your detector, but it's nothing like it was a generation ago. And second, you can over tinker, you can overthink it. Like you want to go all metal mode, unless if there's like perhaps like foil in the ground that you want, that's like littered all over the place. That's the one exception, you know, it, it notching out iron. Some people like that. That's fine too, but give yourself the best chance for treasure. Go all metal, consider the swing speed of your detector and swing over it. The most decorated detectorists I know, they know how to get permissions. They know how to get on good ground. Don't overthink it. This is Merrill signing out. Please hit like. Please hit subscribe. I hope you enjoyed this video.